This is the second most exciting thing I've, I've done this week. This was actually the most exciting here. Um, I went and saw Paw Patrol live. I did take my kids. I didn't go by myself. Um, it's a little odd, though, because uh, I expected them to be people inside of dogs, and apparently they're right on top of them like animatronics, and my kids didn't notice suspension and disbelief, but I did, and it was really creepy to me. <clears throat> they're not as cute as Brian's dog, but they actually are um, rescue dogs, so it, it was a good time. Um, I actually want to show you something real quick um, before we get into the talk. And uh, so this code here, this is, this is no JS code, so this isn't actually front end. I know this is front runners. Um, we're loading a quick config file. I'm doing some you know, preliminary uh, requirements here, put in my API key. And um, I just got a request here, right? So I got a um, request promise, and I have some options here, and I'm loading the URL from, from CodePunk website. And I'm taking those options, I'm putting them into the request. And the result of that, I'm putting right here, which is just an HTML property. And then I have an object here, concepts and keywords. And I'm going to take that, and I'm going to pass it through nlu.analyze. And that's going to execute, and then I'm going to print out the results. And so I got the results down here. And you see a bunch of an array of objects with a text. It's got the keywords. It's got the relevance. It's got the counts. It's got the cell phone going off. <laughs> and then we also have. I embarrassed them, I'm sorry. Um, we also have the key concepts here as we get kind of further down. And so this actually takes the article and it parses that article and it tells you not just what it's about, but some of the key concepts within it and it's a nice categorization. This is JavaScript programming against IBM's Watson. So you can go to work on Monday and say, I know how to program against Watson. And we did absolutely nothing. There was very little code here. Um, it was very simple code, they, but IBM is supporting, obviously, Node.js SDKs. So the point of that is JavaScript has become ubiquitous. It's in robotics. It's in IoT. It's in the browser. It's in the server. It's in NASA you know, spacesuits now. It's everywhere. So Chato talked about how he, he had his developers, they went to Node.js because they could do both the front end and the back end at the same time. It's an important consideration. Now, I started programming back in the um, 90s, I'm 40 years old, so in the early years it was Netscape Navigator 4 and Internet Explorer 5. Uh, this was in the late 90s and the early 2000s. One browser had implemented JavaScript, the other had JScript and VBScript. I don't know if anybody's had the pleasure of writing VBScript. And I wrote an entire insurance application in JavaScript with get element by ID, get elements by tag name, and children. And I hated JavaScript. Um, <laughs> Then the so-called standards years came around where ECMAScript tried to standardize what they were doing. And uh, there was a lot of infighting. A lot of corporations wanted to maintain control of some of the ways that they were doing things. And you know, I still hated JavaScript. 2005, 2006, jQuery. I mean, if you've never read John Rezig's Pro JavaScript Techniques book, I recommend that you do because it's actually his thought patterns on how he created jQuery. So it's an old book, but you get to look inside his mind. And of course, jQuery's selector was based off of CSS query. And he kind of puts all this stuff together. And this, this was great because it meant that you know, browser compatibility was mostly there. You had more functionality. It was an, an ecosystem built up around plugins. But the problem was there were still some security holes. Some things you know, didn't quite work as well. Um, there were browser issues still when modern JavaScript came out. And then there was this whole culture of plugin poppers and script kitties and reasons why WordPress got popular in the first place. So you had teams that would, and, and not to knock on designers, you know, but there's design agencies going to a big corporation when I was a programmer, and um, they would build out this very beautiful thing. Everybody loves beautiful things. And they would take it, and they would have all of these different plugins from different areas of jQuery, and everyone would say, great, that's awesome. Here, programming team, make this. And then programming team opens up a source, source code. There's three or four different versions of jQuery sitting in there. There's a bunch of you know, plugins that are kind of half working. So I still hated JavaScript at that point. Um, and then we kind of had the actual standards years. You know, Chrome became dominant. Mozilla's got their open source thing. Microsoft started Edge, which became Chromium at some point, apparently. Um, and now, like, because browsers weren't tied to the operating system, you had um, faster bandwidth. Um, you, could, you could actually do these updates. You could actually get JavaScript faster. Um, 
So then, of course, we have ECMAScript 6 or 7 or 2015, 2016 next, and this is the reason why you don't let programmers name things, <laughs> right? Um, they actually did have a code name called Harmony. ECMAScript Harmony would have been a way better term to actually use. Now, in this talk, I'm going to actually refer to ECMAScript 6, and when I say that, I actually mean not 5. Um, so everything from the future, modern JavaScript, I'll use the term ECMAScript 6 because I want to confuse everybody. Um, and we're going to go over a few things. Um, so var, for instance, we see it everywhere. You'll actually see it throughout my presentation because Jupyter Notebooks and the iJavaScript plugin work kind of weird with the way they maintain const, uh, context. Um, so with var, you, you have this kind of weird thing here. Like, I'm declaring it twice. Um, and that kind of shouldn't work. But I mean, if I run it, it does. OK, so I redeclared my variable. No big deal. Um, what if I only declare it inside of an if block? That, surely that shouldn't work. Um, that works too. OK, fine. Um, OK, so now I'm going to pass in world since I'm checking my arg against hello. Surely this will just blow up and throw an exception. OK, well, I get undefined because the message is undefined. That's an interesting way. Um, so now let's do this. I'm, I got message. I'm checking to see if it's equal to hello. I'm going to redeclare it right side inside that if statement. Why is this still working? <laughs> so here's something even funkier, right? I got message equal to hello world, and now I'm going to declare the var after it. No way this works. I <laughs> like that works too. So that works because of something called hoisting. So basically, JavaScript variables are scoped at the function level, even if you declare them inside of a conditional. It gets hoisted to the function level. And when the JavaScript engine actually processes something like this, it sees the declaration, and that declaration is actually processed first. So you have some weird syntax going on here. So thank God for newer JavaScript, and you can use the let variable. So if I try to do the same exact thing, but I'm using let, I'll get an exception, like I should. It also introduces constants, which I can appreciate constants as well. So if we try to do this here, we also get an error. Because we declared message, we can't reassign to it, right? Also, constants have to have a value, which is something you would expect. That's going to throw an error too. Thank you. And then let's see if we can blow this one up too. Oh, look, that works. Okay, so if you wanted to actually, you, so you could like with unlike constant where you have to actually assign it to something with let, you don't have to. You can just print this out. Um, real quick. Um, I'm actually going to try to go through some of these a little bit faster, but a real quick point on constants, not the same as being immutable. So the constant means that the variable assignment can't change, but in this first instance, if I try to change it and it's a string, I will certainly get an error. In the second instance, I'm just altering an array. That's not a problem. In this third instance, I'm altering objects. That's not a problem. So don't get constants confused with immutability. Um, now, the whole reason why you'll see var as we move forward is that the I JavaScript notebooks, the entire thing exists in the same loop. So if I try to show you a code snippet and then move on somewhere else and show you the code snippet with the same language, it'll blow up because you can't redeclare a constant. So at least we know that's working appropriately. What's your favorite new feature? My favorite feature is actually string interpolation. Because I had to deal with concatenating strings like crazy um, for most of my life. And so, when you concatenate strings in JavaScript, you're doing a plus sign. Sure, OK. You want to go across multiple lines, you do another plus sign. All right, fine. But I need to use quotes or single quotes. Now I have to start escaping things. All right, maybe that's not too bad. I can, I can live with that. We have to do it in all programming languages, right? But now I actually want to do something to where I have HTML in it. And of course, HTML has sometimes single quotes, sometimes full quotes. So now I have to, OK, how do I want to write this, right? So do I want to have to escape my double quotes, or do I want to have to write my code in single quotes and then have the double quotes inside of them? And then when I do my document.query selector, do I want that to be single quotes? Now, I violate all JavaScript standards. I use double quotes on everything. It annoys everyone on my team. Um, but you follow your own patterns. And so if the programming language is forcing you to switch the way you do your coding style just because of the ways you need to escape things, that's actually not that good. 
And if we wanted to add variables to things, again, we're plusing them. Okay, great. What about string interpolation? Well, I mean, here I got to concatenate everything with plus signs. Hey, I don't have to do it here, right? So, so some, a feature that simple, right? A feature that simple that cleans up your code by using the ticks and then actually having the dollar sign and the curly braces inside. Not only do you get the full string of what you're talking about, but a good syntax highlighter will actually show you directly within um, your string where that is at the variables are. And that's powerful when you have a lot of code, but also this works across lines. So you can actually have a tick, have multi lines without doing the plus concatenation and then end the tick. Another thing that I can appreciate, and again, all these things that I'm showing you are all reasons why now I actually don't hate JavaScript anymore, right? Um, I got big on the WebAssembly chain, chain as it was coming. I could see it, and it was like, oh, man, it's almost here. I'm going to write all this code on the front end. It's going to be whatever I want. I could do Blazor. I could do Rust. I can do any. I can do Python on the front end. I just can't wait for it to get here. And by the time WebAssembly got here, JavaScript has matured to the point, especially with the inclusion of TypeScript. Where's Tommy? Tommy's going to, Tommy's going to give a talk on TypeScript. Um, it's matured to the point where WebAssembly has gotten here and JavaScript is so good, you don't really have to move on. Because none of these quirks that people complain about are really there. Um, default parameters. Before, you had to do this. I'm, I'm accepting three parameters. I've got to check to see if the third one's undefined. I then assign it, and then we'll log that out. Okay, that certainly works, right? Great. But now I can actually default it. And if you're using TypeScript, you can actually set some of them as optional. And just a little shortcut like that, right? Now I don't have to actually add a couple additional lines of code. <laughs> this one I really like too, right? Rest and spread. And, and, and there's some nice funkiness with JavaScript, uh, the way you used to do things. So you have a function, you want to pass parameters to it. And JavaScript's flexible. You can pass whatever you want, right? Um, so I can have something as simple as this function, and I want to pass three arguments to it. And I can check that by checking the arguments built-in variable. And so when I run this and I print out what came through, well, my first argument, the, the array of the arguments, you can see, and then if I just want to print out the first arguments in that, it says, hi. OK, great. That's awesome. But we don't often use this by ourselves. I mean, a lot of times when you use arguments like this, it's because you're overloading it a little bit. So you have a function that probably does something. It's accepting some parameters. And then you want to add additional ones to it. So in this instance, I'm passing in a greeting. And then I want to see what the rest of the arguments are, right? So if I run that, I get hi, which is the greeting. I get the array of arguments. And then if I just want to print out the first argument, it's high again. So I'm actually not getting the remainder there. What I'm getting is all of them. So OK, great. So now I just have to check, and i got to slice it apart, right? So let's slice it real quick. Oh, no. OK, we got an error. So there is no slice on arguments. Why is that? That's because arguments is array-like, not an array. So they were nice enough to create an array-like variable that has some functionality, but not all the functionality. OK, that makes me happy. So now I have to do something like this, where I have to have an empty square bracket dot slice dot call pass in the arguments and pass in one in order to get that. Now you can understand why people started to hate JavaScript. Little, little tiny quirks like this. So what about in modern JavaScript? Well, modern JavaScript, you can actually do the rest parameter, which is dot, 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 and then whatever the variable name is. And that says, give me all the remainder and just put it in here. So if I were to run one of these examples again, you can see that the first argument that gets printed out is the greeting, and the remainder is actually exactly what I'm expecting. It's the rest of them. And that has to be at the end of your um, function declaration. So kind of on the flip side of that is spread. And this basically allows you to pass in um, an entire array of elements. So if we take a look at this, and I'm basically dimensions is an x, y, and z. So I have a, um, an array that has width, height, and depth. And if I wanted to pass that entire thing in rather than breaking apart x, y, and z, 
I had to do apply and of course pass in null and then pass in my variable in order to get that. Well, in modern JavaScript, you can do the dot, dot, dot thing again. And so I can actually take that array um, with width, height, and depth, and I can just pass the whole thing in to a function that's asking for three parameters, and it automatically spreads that out. That's where the name comes from. So instead of you having to then actually break it apart yourself, JavaScript will now do it for you. The beauty of this is actually that spread also allows you to easily combine arrays too. So in this instance, Descartes is x, y, and z. And then I want to create a new variable called variables, because again, you should never let programmers name things, not even in their own code. Um, you can do a, b, c, and then dot, 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 Descartes. And then if I print this out, it'll actually give us all of them. And there was actually a, on Twitter, somebody had asked about, um, somebody had asked about getting a unique set of uh, elements from an array. And so you could have an array of, say, 20 things, and they're not all unique. And how do you just get unique ones? And everybody had their different solutions for it. Well, basically, um, there's a new function in JavaScript or a new, new object called set. And you just take that, pass it into set. That'll create a set object of your unique um, elements that are in there. And then if you take that new set and then you put it in a square bracket with a dot, dot, dot in front of it, that'll actually spread it out into an array of unique items. So in one line of code, you can actually do that. So little quirks like that that before used to be a pain in JavaScript, they're no longer a pain anymore. So one of the reasons why I bring up jQuery is because a lot of what I see um, when I look at, when I, when I see some people's work um, in the community is I do see a lot of people when they spin up a new application, especially a new, new application is going to be front end stuff. One of the very first things, if they're not automatically choosing a framework, they're using jQuery. And I'm like, okay, well, why do you have jQuery in your application? Oh, well, you know, I needed to select the DOM. Bless you. So, <laughs> is there somebody with a gun up there? So, so, so a lot of times I'll see developers who are actually using jQuery just for DOM selection. And you don't have to anymore. Modern browsers actually have an API called the Selector API. So I'm going to blow, this is just JS DOM if you ever had to set up like a phantom DOM. And so before you had your get element by ID, that's a span, get element by tag names, it's an HTML collection. If you wanted to loop over them, great, I got multiple spams. If you wanted to see stuff inside the div, and then let's check out the children. So that's how you used to navigate originally, right? And then jQuery, of course, made things easier. We talked about that. Um, so you could just use that as your selector, pound sign, and then the ID name. And then I wanted to span. And you see this is returning a jQuery object with the spans and the elements within it. And that's what people wanted, an easy way to start selecting DOM elements. And you could actually do that through cascades, um, although a lot of people don't, they use that BEM style design now that I hate with the dash dashes and the underscores. So nobody wants to actually cascade CSS anymore. Um, sorry, I'm talking to myself. I'm having flashbacks. <laughs> so you can, so, so jQuery made all this easier, right? I could do all my DOM selection. But if you're loading a large library like jQuery, which has gotten larger and larger and larger over time, and most people are using it for two things. They're using it for DOM selection, and they're using it to uh, make an AJAX call. But the reality is that you already have that. Now, you have it in two functions, unfortunately. But you can do document.querySelector. And this right here, it's doing dot name, so that's the class. It uses the same CSS selector syntax that you're familiar with, and that gives me an HTML span. And if I wanted to do a query selector all, I go and I had to run that, and then that gives me, um, actually, it would help if I actually ran it. So if I run that real quick, you see I get a node list. So I don't get an HTML collection. I can actually get a node list. That is a distinct difference there. Um, but it is returning the same exact stuff. So if you're using jQuery for DOM selection, stop. You don't have to. It's built into the browser. Unless you're using IE. We'll talk about that later. There's a support group outside. <laughs> so the last thing I want to talk to you about real quick um, before my time is up. And this one is not in demo mode. This is just uh, markdown because I didn't want to have to run this monstrosity. Uh, let's talk about getting data asynchronously. So I'm sure 
some of you have experienced asynchronous JavaScript from back in the early 2000s. Um, if you wanted to write an AJAX call that did something very simply, it might look like this here. Um, I'm passing in a URL, I'm passing in data, methods, whether or not to make it asynchronous, because it doesn't have to be, the content type, the data type, a success, a failure, and an always function, um, because you're going to want to do things based on success or failure. And this isn't a promise, this would have actually been where you passed in the callback, because that's how we did things back then, all right? I'm old. So I'm parsing the result up here, and you can see that when I parse that result, I have to actually see, is this text, is this JSON, is this XML? That request.response.json, that's a custom function I had to write. Um, there's a little bit of TypeScript I accidentally left in here. Um, on the send function, you're basically you do your request.open, you did, you did your request.onready state change, because this was event driven, driven again, it wasn't promise based back then. Um, and then you check your ready state. And once that status is 200, you then send your success. If it was anything else, you sent your failure. Look how long this thing is. Look, I even got rid of some generic error code because it was just taking up too much space. Um, and then this was actually where I built the request because I'm one of those people who declares their function. If I have functions within functions, I put them at the top of it and then call them at the bottom of it. It's going to like to confuse people. That's what I do. Um, but look how long this is. Look how ridiculous. So, so I had to create a ridiculously long function to handle all the things that, when jQuery came around to save us, was just that, dot Ajax on a dollar sign. Now, there's other things that you could pass into it, right? So if we took a look at kind of a rough way of how people would use it, you'd have your Ajax where you'd pass in your, your options object. Method might be post. There's URL. Maybe I'm sending some data. And then um, since this version, so jQuery used to also follow the event-driven thing with the passing in of the success and the failure. And then when they did an update, they did the promise-based one. So now they call done on it because it's returning a promise. And then you could do something with that code. All right. But why use JavaScript when you can use the fetch API? Now the fetch API, same exact thing, right? I'm in this, I'm doing example.aspx and then it's a, it's a promise, so you dot then it, it's called, a, it's called being thenable, which I think is a terrible term that they use. Um, and then you get your response from it, and you can do whatever you want with it, and then you catch off of it. So this is, this is your standard um, promise syntax that's just as clean as the jQuery Ajax syntax, and it's built already in your browser. You don't need to have an extra library for this. If you wanted to post data, okay, there's a little extra involved. Yeah, create your options. Um, and this, I'm actually specifying the content type, and then I'm stringifying the body information. Good to know about new stringify. Thank you very much, sir. And then you can run the same thing, right? And if you have the ability to use async await, you should, because then we can condense it even further. So in this particular instance, you know, we're awaiting the fetch, passing in the options, and then uh, with the fetch API, your response is actually a promise as well. So you'd have to await the response.json in order to get your result. Uh, so that cleans it up even more without having to use an external library. And this looks more like the paradigm that I'm used to, right? But on top of that, you have the power of the fetch API with service workers as well. I'm sure many of you have heard of service workers, progressive web apps. The beauty of this is you can actually have an event listener on the fetch. And when you have an event listener on the fetch, you can do stuff with it. It intercepts it. it so it can, you can actually intercept your AJAX calls out to a server in order to do something with it. Um, in this particular instance, you're combining it with the cache API that's also available in the browser. And then you can check to see if, any, if, the, if the fetch actually matches anything that's in the cache then we're going to return that information as opposed to going out and then getting the fetch. So that's a powerful mechanism in order to, when you're creating your progressive web apps or you're creating mobile applications or even browser applications, for data that's constantly being used, we can cache it first. And without rewriting stuff in your code and doing special things or creating your own functions, you're just going to intercept it. And that's all baked in. Now, to wrap this up, you know, I took a, a jab at Internet Explorer. I just want to say stop supporting it, please. <laughs> so I work for the University of Virginia School of Medicine, and we are rebuilding all of the medical education software, and I have sent out a memo that we are no longer supporting Internet Explorer um, 11. 
and um, <coughs> Windows 10, or actually Windows 7 end of life for extended is 2020. It's, it's the end of 2020. So uh, large corporations, institutions shouldn't be supporting it anymore. They don't need to. They should upgrade to Windows 10. Windows 10 has Edge. Edge will soon be Chromium-based to a certain extent. Um, so I told them we're no longer supporting it. And when the, the head, was it the head of legal? The head of legal from Microsoft sends out a memo and says that Internet Explorer is not a browser. It's a compatibility shim. You should probably listen. Um, <laughs> There is a lot of stuff baked into modern JavaScript that if, if you're existing on the old paradigm of waiting for the browsers to update, you're going to open yourself up to security issues, and you're going to open yourself up to bloated code. Um, so make a note to yourself. Stop supporting Internet Explorer 11. Hey. He's been waiting all day. He's been trying to kill that. Um, so this is actually part of an entire series that I've been doing. There's, there's probably about 20, 30, maybe 40 more of these uh, notebooks that I'll be doing, and I'll be putting them up on YouTube. So if you're interested, you can find me here um, and everything you need. So that's michael.zool.us, but I'm on Twitter at Zool. Um, and then if you're on YouTube, you can search for CodePunk. Um, but thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm.